Thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, this is the uh, Jaeger Project Deep Dive. My name is Julius Pashan Kroling. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. And I work at the Kiali project, more specifically on the distributed tracing team, meaning that I work mostly on Jaeger and open tracing. Now, how many of you were here yesterday for the uh, project intro? Yeah, good, perfect. So um, just like yesterday, I'm starting with some assumptions about your knowledge, right? So let's, we have only 35 minutes again, um, and I'll then just move relatively quickly, and um, I'm uh, starting from where I left yesterday. Just for those who were not here yesterday, um, our context here for Jaeger is microservices, so uh, we are solving a problem that is very common in microservices. Uh, the problem, uh, the observability problem, more specifically, we are one of the pillars of observability. Uh, the other two being, <coughs> the other two being uh, metrics and logging, right? Uh, we talked yesterday about what is distributed tracing, why is it needed, why is it relevant for microservices. Uh, we talked about why open tracing, so why open tracing is required, or um, uh, what, it, what are the advantages of open tracing, what is the context, why uh, was it formed. And we left off with a slide like this one, right? So telling the Jaeger architecture. Uh, so just to recap this slide from yesterday, um, Jaeger is a set of components. Uh, there is one that runs alongside with your application, and that's the component that is um, that is uh, responsible for capturing the data and sending somewhere, right? And this is the the Jaeger client. And uh, the client, uh, when 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 we think about Java or Go, it's a library that you uh, ship with your application, either part of the binary in in Go or as a jar in your WAR packaging or JAR packaging for Java. Now, that, that, um, uh, that client sends data to an agent or to a collector. Um, the collector writes data to the storage, and uh, the, query, the, the query service reads from storage. Right? So more is uh, going deep dive into the client. Um, the client is the party that is responsible for actually building these pens. Right, so if you remember yesterday's span is a uh, data structure that uh, records the time information. So how long, uh, when, when a span started and how long it took to finish. Uh, it also stores uh, logging information uh, if you tell it to, um, tags, um, and, um, and it may also carry data along to, you know, to other uh, ch child spans like baggage items. Uh, the Jaeger client uh, packs data into this pen and dispatches uh, to an agent uh, in the default case. Uh, the agent is something that is running locally, like localhost, um, and sends data via UDP, meaning uh, the client itself uh, can be very thin and uh, it should never fail. Right? So if there is a problem in sending data to the, to the agent, uh, it would just you know, um, not care about. So it's, uh, it, it logs metrics, so uh, the client has a metrics endpoint or you can extract metrics and, and consume that on Prometheus. So you know that um, X spans or X traces were expected to be seen on the server, but if you're seeing uh, less number of, of traces, then, um, then you, you have a networking problem somewhere. Um, the client is extensible, so you can implement your own senders like HTTP sender and UDP senders are two uh, that we have. So if you need a different one, you can implement those uh, and different reporters as well. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, it emits internal metrics. Uh, for the Java client, you can plug a, uh, the micrometer integration. And with that, you can plug any micrometer backend that you want. All right, so who of you are familiar with micrometer? Okay, yeah. So, yeah, you can plug, um, that means one micrometer backend is Prometheus, right? So you can uh, get this information on Prometheus quite easily, or StatsD, or JMX, or any other backend that is supported by a micrometer. So this is the client. Um, so the agent, again, it's uh, a, a component that sits very close to the client, usually localhost. Now, what localhost means today is quite cloudy, Right, so yeah, uh, so we don't know what localhost is, 
Is it the, the bare metal that we're running on? Or is it, in Kubernetes context, is it the node? Or is it the pod? Right, so, um, yeah, so for, for our case here, we just say it sits close to the client. The agent acts as a buffer. So when we are talking about bare metal, we may have one agent uh, and several services running on the same bare metal, on the same server, and uh, all, they all send data to the same agent. The agent um, piles uh, spend data and, and sends to the collector. Uh, it receives data via UDP uh, and sends data to a collector somewhere. Sends via TCP, via usual um, thrift or uh, regular uh, HTTP call. Now, the collector, the collector's uh, sole purpose is uh, to write data to the storage. Now, sounds quite simple, uh, but when you're talking about storage, nothing is really simple, is it? Um, so um, we write to Elasticsearch and Cassandra. Uh, we also have an in-memory uh, data store, so ephemeral. Um, but we also accept, the Yeager collector also accepts data in different formats. So if you have a client uh, instrumented using Zipkin uh, libraries, the Yeager collector can accept that. Um, and also, your client may talk um, the Yeager protocols directly from your client to your collector, so uh, bypassing the agent um, if your environment does not support UDP, for instance. And then we have the Yeager uh, query. Uh, the Yeager query is usually um, bundled with the UI. So technically, the UI and the query, they are different components. The query is only uh, a REST service that uh, accepts queries and uh, gets data from the backend storage and returns JSON. Um, it um, usually comes with AY, so the AY is what we've seen yesterday. Um, you know, it, it assembles that uh, JSON in a easy to consume format for you know, humans. Um, yeah, um, we actually thought about splitting the AY with the query, but we see no real purpose in that, because the query is the least of your problems when you are uh, trying to scale, right? So it's only a limited amount of people looking at the traces, but you have a very high number of uh, people or machines uh, writing data. So uh, the query is the, um, we, we have no benefits in splitting the UI. Right, so this is a, a, the main overview for uh, the components themselves. Um, now this is a deep dive, meaning, um, have to show you how to configure it, or how, uh, tell you how to configure Jaeger. So there, um, the main idea for the components, for the back, uh, backend components for Jaeger, uh, is to follow this idea from the 12 factor apps, that um, your application should be configurable through a different uh, sources of, of um, you know, from, from different sources. So configuration file, environment variables, and um, a command line interface uh, switches or options. So um, the, the first part is how you can configure using a, a uh, Kubernetes config map. This is copy and paste from our, one of our examples. So you specify config map, and uh, within the data for that, for that key, uh, you specify uh, span-storage-type, colon Cassandra, if you want to specify Cassandra data, data store. Um, you can overwrite that by passing a, a, a command line interface option like minus minus storage dot, uh, dash span dot type is memory, equals memory, so if you want to use the in memory. Um, but in some cases, you also want to just uh, export an environment variable. It's easy in Docker, for Docker uh, containers usually. Uh, you, can, uh, you can do a Docker run minus E and then the environment variable, and that's easier than um, using the command line interface option, for instance. So this is the pattern. I'm not gonna show you all the options. Uh, the easy way of finding those options is, you know, uh, docker run and then minus minus help. Um, it prints everything. Or if you have the binary, just run the binary minus minus help. Uh, we try to document every option as well. So, yeah. Um, and so if you, if you are looking for um, tuning uh, Jaeger, we provide some options, some hooks. One of them, or perhaps the two um, more important ones, are queue size and workers. So you can, uh, if your machine is really biffy, you can increase the number of workers, and uh, if you have a lot of memory, you can increase the, the queue size. 
Um, and you can also, if you, if you have a lot of requests coming in, if you have a lot of uh, data to digest, you may want to play with a sampling, right? So instead of sampling every single request that comes in, uh, you may want to sample, I don't know, 1% of the requests, or you can uh, specify a different strategy. Um, and so strategies are something that we are, uh, that, you know, we are planning on improving, so it's on the, the roadmap, especially the adaptive sampling. Uh, but roadmap is something that I have for later. Uh, another, uh, comp another aspect of um, the backend components that we have is a support for um, exposing um, telemetry data, so expo exposing metrics. Right? So uh, by default, we expose data in, in Prometheus format. So we provide an endpoint with a bunch of metrics, like uh, how many uh, traces were started, how many of those were finished. So it, it should have a one-to-one -one relationship most of the time. So you, it's okay to have some uh, traces not finished, but if you have a big number unfinished, then you have a problem somewhere, right? Uh, the same as the number of expense that were reported and, and so on and so forth. So there are two backends that we support right now, XPVARS. Um, or XPVAR, um, which is, I think, the default for Go, and Prometheus, which is the default for everything. Right? So everybody's talking Prometheus. So um, yeah, so uh, that was it for the configuration monitoring and you know um, that uh, the simple parts of the backend. And now we talk more about how to run it. Um, so the simplest way of running uh, Jaeger is the all-in-one Docker image. Uh, this is also known as the standalone if you download the binary from the GitHub release page. Um, and this is, as the name uh, implies, uh, it's a package that contains everything, right? So you just uh, run the binary and it, it starts the collector, the query, the agent, uh, the Y, everything on the same uh, process, uh, opens a bunch of ports, and you can start interacting with it. Um, this is quite okay, and, and it's um, you know it's it's quite um, uh, easy to use. And if you have only one server, uh, one one server with one service running on the same server, uh, that's uh, what you should be using. Um, but that's not always the case. You are not always using you know one server with one service, everything there. Uh, then you probably want to use a deployment production that we call it. So it's not that the other one is not suitable for production, it's just that this use case is probably what you want to use when you go to production, because each component is a binary. So the collector is a binary, the agent is a binary, the, the query UI is another binary. Uh, on Kubernetes, you could deploy them on their own pods and scale them up and down accordingly. All right, so to help you with that, uh, we provide some OpenShift and Kubernetes templates. Uh, it's as easy as kubectl uh, minus f, uh, apply minus f, and then the, the template file. Uh, the tricky part here is uh, storage. <laughs> so um, for those of you who have played with storage on Kubernetes or on any other scalable uh, environment, you know that uh, storage is a tricky part. All right, so um, the word of caution here is do not use our storage templates. Um, use bring your own uh, storage template. So we provide some for guidance, uh, Elasticsearch and Cassandra, but um, you should really look into you know uh, apply that to your infra. So if you have already Cassandra, uh, use the same um, the same patterns that you are using for other applications. And uh, we also have a community contributed Helm chart. Um, it's been a while since I personally use it, but I do recommend you taking a look and, and see if that helps you. Uh, I know it, it, uh, it does help a lot of people, so. Uh, so that's the main idea for the deployment, you know, the, the main two options, uh, um, all-in-one or production. Uh, the next one is talking about the agent. So I kind of uh, hinted earlier that uh, we don't know what localhost is, right? So when we are, uh, um, you know, some years ago it was quite easy. It's local host is local host, and that's it. One to seven, one to seven zero zero one. That's it. Um, bare metal host process, uh, host level process. That's it. Now, um, on Kubernetes, we have at least two options for uh, interpreting as uh, local host. It's either the node where the pod is running, 
or uh, the pod itself. We could also argue that it's a container, but it doesn't make sense, right? Um, so we have then uh, two options of running uh, the agent for Kubernetes uh, as a daemon set or as a sidecar. So as a daemon set, you probably you probably want to use a daemon set when you have all the pods on that node running belonging to the same tenant or having the same sort of uh, security um, concerns, right? So they, they belong to the same owner, basically. So if you are uh, deploying uh, Jaeger or um, the agent in a in a machine that is that belongs to one company alone, uh, if you're not a like a cloud provider, then it's probably okay to have as a demo set. Now the tricky part is the agent has a long-lived connection to the collector. So if you have ten collectors, but one node, it means you have one agent talking to one collector alone. Right? So you have if you have a lot of data, uh, you probably do not want to use a demo set. You probably want to use a sidecar so that you spread your load uh, throughout your infra. And uh, the sidecar approach is, um, I think I don't need to tell what the sidecar is. Uh, so the second container in the pod would be the agent. And the, 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 your application, the main container for the pod, sends data to the agent via local host. Uh, and that agent then makes a long-lived connection to the collector. So if you have 10 collectors, and you have 10 instances of your service, uh, you have 10 agents, each one having a long-lived connection. So if you, uh, then that means, um, you know, uh, you use, in theory, you, pr you use uh, all your collectors. So it's this um, about deploying the agent. Now, um, one question that came um, a couple of times already was, uh, how about multi-tenancy? How about if I want to run Jaeger in a multi-tenancy setup? And uh, then we ask you, what is multi-tenancy then for Jaeger? Right, so um, there are several aspects of multi-tenancy that um, uh, are not well defined for us. So what is tenancy? Is it tenancy at this panel level? At, at, you know, is the application being traced uh, multi-tenant? And should the spend reported by that application go to different Jaeger instances? Um, or should you know, Jaeger use different namespaces for different applications? So there are quite a, f a few questions about what is multi-tenancy for Jaeger. Uh, and we, we cannot pretend to know that we know all the use cases. Uh, and you know, we just use a microservices approach, which is don't do that. I mean, let something else do that in your name. And because the, the, um, uh, the components themselves, they are lightweight, we, we can afford to have multiple installations of Jaeger in our infra. Right? So if you have two or three tenants, each one of those in a uh, Kubernetes namespace or in an OpenShift project, uh, you can just then just install a, a Jaeger in, one, in each of those uh, namespaces. Right? Um, I think the overhead for the, for the agent uh, is like 20 megabytes. So the binary is only 20 megabytes. And the whole infra, the whole binary, the standalone, uh, is less than 30 megabytes. So it's not that exp expensive to have uh, multiple instances of Jaeger. Um, and even if you, you cannot solve this problem by playing with your uh, deployment architecture, by playing with namespaces, by playing with uh, setting agents, talking to you know, different um, uh, collectors, uh, you can still extend the client to implement your own uh, tenancy um, uh, model. Right, so in that case, uh, we would be having uh, the client. Um, so this is a, a, an image of, of the, the, the traditional model, I would call it, uh, where one agent talks to one um, collector belonging to a tenant. Uh, and if uh, there is another application, uh, we have the same, but talking to a different. So we just duplicate the infra, right? So, and it's not that expensive. Now, the second one is, uh, we may implement a different um, reporter and or sender with our own requirements and make them choose which collector to talk to. Right? So uh, in that case, the knowledge is on the client side, closer to your application than to the infra. So uh, we hope that with uh, this solution, uh, multi-tenancy is solved by basically doing nothing. Right? So let you guys handle it.
Um, yeah. So if it is not, if you if you have so if you have a scenario where you cannot uh, fix by any of those strategies, then join the community and let's discuss that. You know, it, it is we're quite open uh, to do uh, to doing something as long as it makes sense and as long as it benefits uh, a big number of people. Now, a very similar approach we took with uh, regards to security. All right, so what is security for us? So what should we protect? Should we protect the agent? So should we trust that the agent is receiving data from untrusted sources? Like, do we have microservices in our infra, in our Kubernetes cluster, which are not trusted? Or can, should we just assume that everything that is running there is running there for a reason, and we trust people who deployed those? So there are scenarios where, um, uh, like in startups, we trust every code that is running there in theory, right? Um, but for banks or for uh, healthcare, we probably want to do some more security tightening there. Uh, and just like with uh, multi-tenancy, it looks like everyone has a different requirement. And again, because the components are lightweight, we can afford to also have, um, you know, to duplicate or to have a, a other components or to delegate those things um, to other um, parts of the infra like security proxies. Right, so if you want to protect the collector, uh, we can place an OAuth proxy in front of the collector and then get the agent or the client to send an OAuth token to the collector. Right, so we, we completely got security off of our client and of our collector, and still it's quite uh, useful for most people. Right, so one feature that is missing is telling the agent to send uh, how to get a token, a bearer token or um, JWT, how to get it and how to send it. But the client, uh, I, they, they are able to do that already. Right? So they, you can specify when configuring the client, you can either expose an environment variable or you can just configure the client uh, programmatically saying, uh, this is the username and password or uh, this is the bearer token to be used. The collector itself is not aware of the security part because the proxy runs before it. So if it got the request, then it's, uh, then it's um, acceptable, right? Uh, there is a, a, an example of how to do that using Keycloak. Keycloak is a single sign-on solution, open source project as well. Uh, and, you know, it just works, right? So why should we uh, do this kind of thing on Jaeger if we can leverage uh, other parts of the infra? Now, on Istio, uh, we could use as well uh, mutual uh, TLS uh, connections so that we trust that we are talking to services which are trusted in our infra. Um, so if you have experience with Istio and if you know how to do that, um, yeah, feel free to come to us afterwards. Uh, it will be a nice blog post, by the way. Um, so yeah, it, and again, the same with multi-tenancy. Uh, if your security requirements, they are not... Um, they cannot be satisfied with this scenario. You can still implement your own reporter, right? So uh, it's extensible. Um, yeah, so the roadmap. So um, we, we have in the roadmap for, for Jaeger those three features. Uh, the first one is data pipeline, right? So imagine that, you, that we are receiving spans and instead of just letting data flow to Cassandra or to Elasticsearch, we want also to have this data on Spark. We want to have some uh, knowledge about this data. We want to do some um, extract uh, insights from it. We want to uh, do what uh, you know. Want to understand uh, what is the service path for a given uh, request pattern, so that we can say, well, whenever my order, uh, my checkout endpoint is called, then those are the services which are involved. So that when I'm, I'm doing an upgrade, or you know, I can see what are the critical paths uh, in my application. So when I do an upgrade, I know well those are the things that I have to take care of uh, before doing the, the upgrade. The second thing is adaptive sampling that I mentioned before. So adaptive sampling is uh, on the fly, letting um, the sampling change based on on our current requirements. Right. So right now we can kind of achieve adaptive sampling by playing with uh, Kubernetes pods. So we could have a one service backed by two sets of deployments on, on Kubernetes, and then um, 
or Istio as well, we can just switch uh, like blue green and, and, and AB and so on and play with uh, sampling rates. Uh, but we cannot do actual, you know, more than that. So adaptive sampling is to provide more features on, on or, or a smarter decision about the sampling. So should I sample this request or should I not sample this request? That's the basic decision. Uh, the third one is the storage plugin. Uh, and this one is quite hot right now, so we are, uh, um, it, we are actually working on, it, on, on this one uh, at this moment. Um, and we are trying to figure out what is the best way of doing storage plugins uh, for our backend. Uh, so the backend is a Go uh, application, is a Golang application. So there are quite a few different ways of doing plugins. Uh, looks like the preferred one was to use uh, like Go plugins. There is something called the Go plugins. The problem is if the plugin code uh, has a dependency on a, on a version of package A, uh, package A version one, and the main code has, you know, uh, package A version two. Then you have both in the binary in the end, and that leads to funny uh, situations. Um, yeah, so uh, that was pretty much it that I had. Uh, I talked actually too much. Uh, we are almost. Um, we have only a few minutes left for questions. One message that I want to uh, share with you, or wanna, I want to ask you, is uh, to join our community. So if you guys were at the, the keynote today, uh, there was this slide where people just you know, raised hands and asked, asked uh, the community for something, or asked the, the maintainers for something. And uh, so re remember that, sli that slide when, you know, um, do raise your hand and ask us when you, when you need something. And uh, yeah, join our community. Uh, you know, if you have something interesting to to share, um, feedback on on you did something with uh, uh, Jaeger, so you, you deployed in some way, um, share with us. Um, we are also happy to take uh, guest blog posts on our medium. Um, yeah, so we meet every uh, two weeks on Zoom. It's open for everyone. The meeting uh, details are on uh, the main Jaeger core uh, repository, uh, GitHub repository. We're also quite active on Gitter, and we also have a mailing list, so it's quite easy to reach out to us. Uh, yeah, and uh, that's pretty much it, and um, I think we have uh, like seven minutes for questions. Yeah. Uh, if Gluster can be used for the backend, uh, um, <laughs> I understand cluster being as uh, you know the, the block level storage, right? So it's right. Uh, we need something running on top of that. So perhaps the, uh, perhaps Cassandra could use cluster or Rook, as I saw yesterday, um, as a mean to um, as you know the actual storage is. But we need uh, something more up like Cassandra or Elasticsearch. Yeah. Any means to limit the um, uh, number of events reported by clients? I have in my uh, uh, systems often the problem that uh, an application goes havoc and very really floods my, my logs. The idea is that this would be a... So the question is if there is a way uh, of limiting how many spans a client can report, right? Um, yeah. yeah, so... Um, this is a good idea, actually. So um, this is something that I can see implemented as a um, as a sampling strategy. Yeah, sorry. So you can you can uh, talk to him and exchange later if you want. <laughs> um, so, but the, so also part of the adaptive sampling is blacklisting services. So you could probably blacklist that service after some time, after spamming the, the agent or the collector. Uh, but it's not something that we have right now. So this is a great idea. So open a, an issue on the uh, Git, uh, GitHub repo with this idea, I think. If it is not on people's mind right now, it should be. Yep. Perf, you mean for the kernel? Yeah, I don't know. Like I have C applications that actually have defined trace points in them that are accessible via, say, system path. Um, are there any examples of how to connect that with Jaeger tracing? 
Mm, no, not not that I'm aware of. So tracing. So what Jaeger traces is um, the. From, from the Linux perspective, is the user space things, so it's the application running on user space, right? right. And user space okay, all right. Um, it would make sense. So I've heard this question yesterday as well. So you're not the first one to ask that, uh, but it's not something that uh, we did or experimented with. It's mostly uh, microservices, mostly things that are, that developers, you know, uh, writing writing uh, business applications are dealing with. No, the, the use case is that it's useful to know not just what went into the individual container or pod and what came out of it, but also what happened in the container. Right. So, the, yeah, that's exactly what uh, I think the, the guy might even be here. So if you are just, Great. yeah, so there. So talk to that guy. So the idea is to, um, if you have an I.O. wait and you don't know why, you would use trace information to understand what went wrong or what's going on there, right? So. Um, uh, I think he, uh, I asked him to start a, a conversation with the community about that. So if you're also interested in, in this part, so just join the conversation. This is yours. Okay. Um, Let me take one question from the back, because I, I've, I was, yeah, because I, 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 oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. So I have two quick questions. Is it possible to use QLDB instead of Cassandra? Uh, you're not the first one to ask. There is actually a, a GitHub issue for that. Mm -hmm. So go on that GitHub issue and give a plus one. Okay. And the next one, what is uh, your view on um, open, trans, uh, open tracing versus uh, open census? So open tracing is an instrumentation API. Um, open census is a... So do you know Micrometer for Java? No. So uh, open census is um, a, a complete... Uh, set of, of components to have not only tracing but also monitoring and logging for your application. So uh, there is a Jaeger uh, exporter for uh, Open Census. It works. Um, it's quite different than, than, than Open Tracing. My personal opinion is that um, as a so for, for monitoring Java applications, I would use Micrometer because that's uh, what I see as the standard right now. Um, for tracing, uh, I would use the Open Tracing API um, because that's vendor neutral, basically. So I can ship my uh, my application with a no op tracer, and uh, and I'm not using any vendor. I'm not using any tracing, but the tracing hooks are there. So, but if you if you want a complete solution, if you want one API to do everything for you, uh, then you should certainly go with Open Census. Spans dropped. So at the agent level, uh, spans dropped. So if you have a, a mismatch between the spans reported by the client and the, the, the spans that you see on the server, then there are spans being dropped somewhere. Either the queue is full, uh, you know, at the agent side, or um, the, the collector may be, uh, I think the collector is not dropping anything, but uh, the agent certainly is if the queue is full, for instance. Right? So that's the first early indication of something going wrong. Um, yeah. Then the question in the front. So what? Are, yeah. Okay. Cool. Do we have time more? Uh, time? Two minutes. Yeah. For yeah. Okay. So we have uh, time for one or two questions more. I still have stickers. <laughs> Yeah, so, for your not asked question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, one cool idea that uh, we are starting to think about is like the, the tail-based uh, sampling. Meaning, the decision to trace or not trace is done after the fact, right? So we, we, we store data somewhere, 
and we either drop it or we record it and we send it somewhere. Because uh, you may have an error happening, like three microservices down there, but the first microservice is not aware of that or you know, at that time that it started, it did not know that it would fail, right? So um, it, it would place data somewhere or store data somehow uh, and if the trace finishes completely and there is no you know, information, and then it just drops somewhere along the line. So perhaps the agent, perhaps the collector, uh, something would drop this data and not store on, on permanent storage. That's one cool feature that you can think of. Yeah. Yeah. So alerting. So the question is whether there is alerting for Jaeger, right? Basically, um, there is not. Uh, but there is an open tracing contrib library that uh, converts your spend data into metrics and exposes that to uh, Prometheus and so on. And then you can use that data to create an alert. Right, so either with the alert manager from, from, from Prometheus or plug any other alerting system. So here itself, or, you know, so the trace is good for debugging an issue and not for really monitoring, I would say. Right, so monitoring is more like metrics, uh, perhaps logs. Uh, but once you, you see that, you, that one request went wrong, then you go and debug that one. Do we have time? We are, sorry, um, you can ask me later, yeah? Thank you.